look at blockers, showstoppers, impediments. Just look at what's slowing the organization down or what's stopping the organization from doing certain things. If we just look at all of that, visualize them, and start fixing those things, guess what happens? Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Hello and welcome to the show. Today we have a guest joining us who I've been desperate to get on for quite a while now. He is the CEO of Akaditi, more on that later. He's a farmer from Ghana. He's a Morphia stunt double from the movie Matrix. You may recognize the likeness. And he's an all-round top gentleman. He's got a voice that will be so soothing, you'll keep playing this back for eternity. <laughs> I'd like to welcome to the show Nana Aban. Nana, it's such a good, good, good feeling to have you join us today. I'm excited. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. The pleasure's all mine, Marcus. It's been forever. Been looking forward to <laughs> you know, connecting on this podcast. And I'm really glad that we've managed to get to it. Me, me too, my friend, me too. We, we call ourselves brothers from another mother and absolutely. we'll hopefully find out why that is today. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think that we come from the school of common sense and uh, that is missing in the world today. Well, in it's definitely a lacking capability, isn't it? Before we dive into what's lacking today, because there are many other things lacking, I want to start the journey back to Nana the farmer in Ghana, who is mixing it up in the world of fruit, veg, spices, and a little bit of moonshine on the side, I, I have potentially heard on the drums out there. Uh, how does that individual go from being a farmer in Ghana to being a lead agile coach at companies like KLM, Capital One? BP, Ghana Police, Jaguar Land Rover. And here we are today. Talk me through that journey. Well, you know, I come from a large uh, family. I was born in the village in West Africa. I come from a large family. Our families span across the old Mali Empire. So Mali, Burkina Faso, Ghana. So where we are predominantly in Ghana today. We've got families in Nigeria. We've got families in Ivory Coast and Liberia. But most of my family is today around Ghana, Nigeria, and also Mali and a few in Burkina. Um, so I was born in a village uh, and uh, basically a farming community. And uh, so I grew up, you know, basically walking around barefoot and, uh, you know, looking after goats and chicken and, and vegetables. And, and, you know, uh, I, uh, I had the... Uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to have the experience of uh, being to be exposed to uh, lots of interesting people in my family, you know, who were very great farmers as well. So that became a passion for me. I just loved the idea. And I saw farmers as, you know, people that were doing something as incredible, like, you know, um, doctors, you know, they're saving lives and these farmers are mm -hmm. producing food and people need food to live. So farming for me stuck, it really stuck and it became a passion and it's something that I've always uh, sort of kept uh, very close to my heart and I thought, well, uh, there's something about farmers as well that, uh, you know, very level-headed, very patient. They can watch crops grow mm -hmm. for months and um, they watch animals grow for years and they're just, you know, they're just very patient people. They think about the future, but they're focused on now. They've got to feed those crops. They've got to feed those animals. So they have this mindset where they're focused on now, but they can see the future. And that patience, that patience, that resilience, that tenacity, uh, I kind of, uh, you know, learned a lot from that. And so growing up and coming to the UK and, you know, spent some time in the UK education system, when I got back to Ghana, I decided that I was definitely going to get it back into farming. 
And so uh, farming for me is a way to keep me balanced. It's a way to keep me real and to keep me grounded and uh, a way for me to truly practice um, this, this spirit of Ubuntu, you know. So, uh, yeah, it keeps me grounded. And I think that's what's really helped me in all of these international assignments, you know, where I've been. Um, people seem to gravitate to me for some strange reason or the other uh, because of my common sense approach. And I think that's largely from my farming family background and my experience in the bush <laughs> i love it there's so much to think about on this journey you've just talked about i'm trying to picture you barefoot running around you are the most yeah. sharp dressed man i've ever met i mean when i first met you i was like wow this dude's just walked off the cover of gq or vogue i mean you are <laughs> on point with your fashion so i'm imagining this contrast between nana out on the farm barefoot running around and then when I see you at work it's just incredible um, you talked I'm, about I'm, I'm a bushman I'm a bushman I'm a bushman <laughs> I mean uh, just to just to make it a bit clearer in your mind and in the mind of the audience just picture for a minute the Aboriginal bushman that's you and that's me and then next True. minute picture in your mind me walking through an airport here yeah, with uh, a, an Amani suit <laughs> I know I know I know. I've got to come out. I missed out on Agile in Africa this year, but I've got, I can't wait to come out and see you in Ghana and see you in your, your homestead up on there. Oh. I've seen so many photographs. Oh, so much of the, uh, the love that's gone into that territory of yours where you, are, where you go and ground. We talked about, well, you talked about patience. The, this, this genesis of farming and this mindset of the farmer. Patience, resilience, and tenacity. And I think they are such perfect words for the environment we find ourselves in today. How, you know, we always get asked, how do, how do people cope in this complex world we're living in today? And I think those three words taken from your farming background really sum it up for how we should all start behaving and what we need today. What do you think? Absolutely. Um, one of the things I say to people um, is, um, you know, whenever you face a challenge or you've been given some bad news, um, you must learn to do a pause. Before you go into fight or flight, you must learn to do a pause because those few seconds could save your life. And practicing the pause is an incredibly powerful thing because you resist the urge to lose control. You resist the urge to, to allow the situation to overpower you. And so by practicing this pause and then you respond, you never react, you always respond. You must always respond. When you react, you lose control. When you respond, it's measured and it's calculated and um, you're able to get at least a desired outcome, you know, uh, something that you want to, to achieve. So the, the, you know, tenacity, resilience, patience in today's world, people are reacting, constantly reacting. You look around you, they, they, they hear some bad news, they say, oh my God, you know, they hear something, it's like they fall apart. Yeah. And people keep asking me, <laughs> even now, we love your energy. And I said, what energy? And, and they say, every single day we meet you, 365 days a year, every day we meet you. When we ask you how you do it, you say, great, fabulous, amazing, fantastic, awesome. And they can't I said, do you ever have a bad day? I said, no. Because for me, there's nothing like a bad day or a bad life. It's just a bad moment. It's a difficult moment. It's a challenging moment. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think that those three um, key things have actually helped me a lot. And if we apply them to real world situation, and this is why I love all the stuff you're doing as well, you know, with Bryce and all the other guys. And, you know, just practicing that pause and just focusing on that patience and looking at resilience, talking about tenacity. I think that can give so much power um, to you to be able to deal with anything. When you get a bad news, some, you know, some bad news about your health or family or a, your business, you cannot 
lose control. You know, it doesn't, it won't serve you and it won't do you any good. And um, when people say, well, I'm only human, I say, you know what, that is a statement. Not an excuse. That, that is just a statement that is just a cop out. I'm only human. And that is just basically the easiest clause to use when you don't want to be accountable and take responsibility. I'm only human Correct. is actually speaking to your sense of being ordinary when you're actually extraordinary. And all you have to do, you know, is embrace this possibility of mindset. So, yeah, so you're right. So in today's world, we do need these three key things to keep us going. I love that. It reminds me, of the, I can't remember who said it, but it's that phrase of how you react to somebody else's behavior is on you or how you yeah. react to an event is on you. You have a choice. Yeah. And if you are reactive and strap line for this podcast, bad leaders react, good leaders plan, great leaders think. So if you're a bad leader who reacts, be it to what somebody says or what somebody does or a situation, then you're going to get a negative outcome. Absolutely. Both physically, mentally, socially, depending on where that happens professionally. And Absolutely. I love this practice, practice the pause. You know, you know, one of my great mantras is slow down to speed up. So take yes. that time, slow down. Yeah. And also, you know, we talk about think, right, share. The yes. preamble to think, right, share is stop, breathe, think. Mm. Same as practice the pause. So when, whenever, whenever anything happens, stop. Yeah. In, instigate the pause. Your reaction is to pause or to stop. And in that moment of, of mindfulness, breathe, think, and then act. And that act is a response. As you said, you have to respond, not react. So the reaction is to do nothing, is to pause. Yes. yes. And then you calculate, you think, and you can do all of that in three seconds. Sometimes you need to take longer, but even if you just take that, very short time to do that. As you said, a whole different outcome is going to manifest if you do that. I think Absolutely. that's so powerful. Absolutely. It's worked for me every single time that I get into a situation. It could even be an accident. It could anything. I mean, I've been involved yeah. in like really difficult situations. And every time something happens and I practice the pause, I do something else to hack into my, yeah. my mental yeah. processes. And um, it actually just stops me from going into, you know, meltdown or going into like, uh, yeah. you know, that sense of a uh, loss of control. And people say, Nana, sometimes you come across so mechanical, you know, you come across like you're just a machine. I said, no, it's not that because no. I ask myself a question uh, when I'm in that pause state. What do I want from this situation? And then secondly, what will it do to me if I react? And I talk about, I think about my health. I think about the situation. I think about looking bad. You know, for example, somebody sold me land and um, it was a terrible deal. And um, I just kept, I didn't react. The guy said, he's not giving back the money. I said, okay. Um, I said, all right, I'm not going to pay for the rest of the land because I'll just take what I've paid for. And then uh, it's taken almost a year for him to get round to give me land. But guess what's happened? Um, a year later, me not reacting to his negative behavior, because I'm allergic to negativity. Me yeah. not reacting to his negative behavior, not getting pulled into his vortex, into his conflict, into his storm. Um, now I've got a better piece of land. It's giving me something else and it's a better piece of land a year later. But if I had gone into a meltdown with him, I would have gone to court. It would have been in court in the next five, ten years. And his conscience, me simply not reacting to this guy, his conscience has been playing on him because I've done everything to this guy and he can just do this and you know, he can get me. He can do anything. And he's not doing nothing. I just refuse to engage with negativity. That's, such a, that's a great, great mindset. Uh, you, you mentioned a word in there that our listeners might not know, but I do. Ubuntu. Yeah. Say it for me <laughs> in, the, in the right way, because I probably mispronounced it. No, and then explain well. to our listeners. I'm trying. I'm trying to learn these words. You know this. Explain to our listeners what it is, because I love it. It's beautiful. 
Ubuntu. There you Ubuntu. go, you see? Ubuntu. I love the way you say that. <laughs> carry on. Carry on. Say it again and then carry on. Ubuntu. <laughs> Thank you. Ubuntu Give is this philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus, <laughs> I love you, brother. I love you, man. <laughs> it's a uh, you know, it's an African word, you know, and it's um, it's it's really a powerful concept, and it's it talks about our shared humanity. It's uh, it's part of the African philosophy, and it basically means because you are, I am, and because I am, you are, and it's really about our shared humanity. Now, this concept of Ubuntu has given birth to, interestingly, two things in my life. And one has been Akaditi. And Akaditi actually is a Guruni word from the northeast of Ghana. Um, and basically, Akaditi means um, incorruptible. Oh, I love that. Because I refuse to compromise on good values. I refuse to compromise on great ideas. I refuse to compromise on my desire for excellence. I refuse to compromise on my ethics. And so um, Akaditi was a word that basically came out of my feelings of Ubuntu, that I wanted to do good for humanity. And so Akaditi is about basically reshaping the corporate landscape. <laughs> And transforming the corporate, <laughs> <laughs> the corporate landscape, you know, bringing, you know, these ancient ideas and bringing this concept to be able to help organizations to recover and to restore them to their, you know, their, their state of Ubuntu. Now, uh, the other concept which has come out of this, you know, philosophy of Ubuntu is uh, H2H. So I started this H2H um, idea. And H2H is basically human to human. And, um, and I said, and I've been talking about this in many corporate circles, it's, it's the future is now. The future that we speak about and what we're looking at today, um, you know, it's not about B2B or B2G, business to business, business to government, or B2C, business to customers. Uh, it's not about B2B, business to business. All of these, you know, binary models you know, it's not about that anymore. It's not about these organizational models or these business models. Um, it's not about any of those or B2E, business to employees. No, it's about H2H. It's human to human. Whatever you're doing, whether it's cybersecurity, whether process improvements, strategy development, sales and marketing, it's all about H2H. You're looking to connect with people. And so Ubuntu has given birth to Akaditi and also this idea of H2H. Boom. Wow. I, I can see why we are now ethically siblings and psychologically so. So your vision for Akaditi, I'm just reading this off your website, making the world a better place by empowering people to do great things together. And I love that. And just what you've been talking about, this refusal to compromise with your ethics, excellence, good ideas and you must do good again we're aligned my three rules number one always do the right thing number two if you're gonna do it do it right and number three is have fun and i think we, we do all of those things together and this human to human when i go into organizations or i do conferences i'll ask people okay everybody what business are you in and you remember i did this at agile africa ask the yeah. audience what business are they in we got engineering farming banking military <laughs> And I'm like, wow, I said, you're all wrong. And people look at me like, when I mean, you're in the room, they're like, who the hell is this guy telling me what my business is? And I'll just go, you're all wrong. And then pause and they go like, I said, you're all in the people business. And you see the tension and the angst go, oh, he's right. He's yeah. right. Because yeah. there's not a business, there's not an organization that isn't fundamentally human to human built yeah. on people and the ai is coming the war of the robots is the scary thing over the horizon but even that will not be able to be what it's going to be without the human element and i think it's so beautiful the word you word you know you cancel out all b to b b to c b to the alphabet it's h to h it's this people element back at the heart of what we do and, and our you know my sort of strap line for this is you know we help 
people think differently so they can make a difference. Yes. Yeah, or help people make a difference by thinking differently. It, it's, it's giving people that ability now to do what we're good at, yes. to be patient, yeah. to be resilient, to be tenacious, yes. and get them back not only at the heart of it, but front and center. Because we've all over been overtaken haven't we, by process, technology, AI, all the latest buzzwords that all the execs go, man, I must have this. Where's the people being brought along on that yeah. journey? And I think that's where we sort of came together with the agile piece of why isn't this working? What are the problems yeah. that we're seeing here? So let, let's touch on that, agile. Yeah. So yeah. we both got into the agile world. We both had our fair share of fun doing agile, how we're going to call it. <laughs> Talk me through your experiences. You've been at some big companies. You're a well-known player in the Agile world. Tell me so, about Agile um, and Nana. My, my, my desire to want to be in this global Agile community has been largely around taking this Agile thing as one of the enablers. It's just one of many enablers that we can take to use elements of it, not, you know, import everything like some evangelist and like it's a new religion, but taking all of these interesting <laughs> ideas, <laughs> taking all of these interesting I ideas. That. We'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and, you know, trying to make sure that people can use it as a way to unlock some aspects of their thinking, their processes. You know, it's a word with a small letter A, you know, and that's for me holds more value than the uppercase A. And so Agile, when it started, yeah, you know, I switched from management consulting, project management to doing some Agile stuff like 20 years ago or 20 plus years ago. And then I decided that, okay, I'm going to try my hands at a few interesting things. Let me, let me try Scrum Master, Product Owner, then went into Program Management, and I went straight from there into the boardroom in the you know, police and also in the private sector. However, um, the good thing about my, <laughs> my, my way of thinking, you know, of course, it goes back to my avatars, Morpheus, you know, um, is that I never get stuck on an idea. Because essentially, because I know it's all about people and because I know that my focus is H2H and my focus is like Akaditi being incorruptible, because I know my focus is all about building organizations that are best suited to human beings, for people to, organizations that are made up of moms, dad, aunties, uncles, children, nephews, cousins, these are real people. And but when they come into the workplace, well, we just want them to forget who they are. And somehow we think, OK, we just give them process system structures and that's it. So I never really got stuck into this, um, you know, like this agile sort of religion. And I thought, no, um, I need to keep shifting the conversations, but I'm, I'll get into it and I'll, you know, use that as an avenue to get into organizations and help them to understand that your goal is not agile. <laughs> your desire for speed, going back to some of the things you're talking about in Big Things Fast, your desire for speed and for agility is actually, those are outcomes of critical thinking. And so yeah. when you try to put the cart before the horse, this is the problem. And so I have never really got stuck. I don't get carried away. Yeah, with the latest fashion or with the latest ideas. I, I, I'm, I'm just one of those people that I tend to step back a bit, observe like a farmer. I look at the farm and I think to myself, hmm, uh, let's see how this is going to play out. But I'll get involved. I'm a team player, so I'll get involved. Yeah. Uh, however, as I get involved, I'm asking questions. Why are you doing this? Why do you want to do agile? Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do that? And so... <clears throat> I guess people, kid. mom, why, why, why? Well, well, it, uh, and I think it goes back that. to it, absolutely, absolutely. I've always been that kid who's always been asking yeah. why. At age eleven, oh I God. said to my parents, um, "I'm going to leave home at 16. And uh, my dad looked at me and said, "Okay." My mom looked at me, "You know, you're not." And I said, "Yes, I am." And then <laughs> it's a typical uh, dad version, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. So form five, I put my pen down after my last exam. Form five, and I went home. I got my rucksack. And I said, I'm off. My dad said, see you later. 
and my mom said, you're not going anywhere. I said, yes, I am. Watch me. And I went, I went out the door and I traveled the whole of West Africa between 16 and 19. And I think this, for me, uh, resonates with all the stuff that I've done throughout my life. And that's where Agile, for me, yes. you know, I've always said it's about agility. People have been demonstrating all types of agility from time immemorial, from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age, you know, uh, the Industrial long Revolution. Long before 2001. Long before <laughs> 2001. So this assumption, I mean, it's this assumption, this 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 arrogance that, you know, somehow human beings are not agile. For me, it's just wrong because, you know, from what before you were even born, you're the fastest swimmer. You know, you got to the egg, you know, you're the fastest swimmer. You got to the egg, I'm so you're already agile. You. Exactly. Before, before you were you born. The beginning. What yeah. did you say at the beginning? Common sense. Common sense. You know, yeah. we've all been agile as long as we've all had common sense. Absolutely. Whether we're choosing to use that and apply it or not is a different question. That is. How's your uh, How's your approach gone down? Because we talked about you know it's a new religion. There's certain cult like behaviours in the community. You barrel in. You're a character. You're not going to miss you when you walk in the room looking sharp and with your opinions dealt in the professional way, asking why a lot. How have you felt that it's gone down or how has it not much felt? How have you seen that go down? The interesting thing, Marcus, is that um, when we talk about business agility, when I talk about you know business agility, organizational agility, when I talk about tech agility, people agility, that resonates more with executives than this agile word. And, and interestingly enough, over the years, um, I have basically used, um, it's, I have challenged, constantly challenged executives and senior managers, directors, to think a little bit more about this agile adoption and this agile transformation. And I'm saying to them, you know, you really do, you, you, there's a precursor to this. And what you need to do first, number one, is that critical thinking, common sense. Number two, you need to look at organizational design and culture. Then when you look at organizational design and culture and the structure of the organization and how you're set up, then practices is what comes much later. But people, organizations have been throwing practices at organizations, going in with coaches and trainers, and they've been wondering, why is it failing? They've been wondering, why, why is this failing? And they still don't understand. There's a precursor. There's two steps before you got to do this agile stuff. There is the mindset, the critical thinking, the common sense, and there's this organizational design, restructure, or whatever you need to do, the structure of the, organ the systems, the processes. You need to look at the culture. And then you talk about practices later. But we talk about practices first, and it defeats the objective. And executives love it. And So I want to take a break yeah. there. During the break... I want you to get your Morpheus black glasses on. And when we come back, we're going to take a red pill and I'm going to follow you down the rabbit hole and we're going to discuss more about why Agile's failing and what we can do about it. See you after the break. Hey folks, Bryce here. If you're listening to this and you're liking what you're hearing and you're wondering, am I a red team thinker? We have an easy way for you to find out. Just go to the show notes, click on the link there to our free assessment to find out if you are a red team thinker and what you can do to think more effectively, to lead more effectively, and to make better decisions faster in your complex world. Like I said, the link is in the show notes, or you can simply go to our website, redteamthinking.com. Check it out. I can't wait to see how you score. Welcome back. During the break, Nana left and Morpheus came to join us. We took a red pill each, and I'm about to follow him down the rabbit hole. <laughs> you see what I mean? This is scary how uncanny your resemblance is. Just lean into the camera and go, what if I told you? Go on, do, do that for me. Come, come and lean in, and your voice. Are you ready, ladies and gentlemen? ready for this. What if I told you? Brilliant. 
<laughs> Brilliant. So, oh, we're, we're having, having a fun. Me. I want to tell you. We are. Let's stop. Let's get serious. <laughs> that was a serious matter. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I know. I know. Right. So, talk to me. We talked before the break about why Agile is failing. You mentioned a couple of reasons. Talk to me about the approach that you've taken. How are you getting this, this clarity for the client, for the customer? And what are they thinking about Agile? So I try as much as possible to avoid the word completely. And um, I tend to start all my engagements with a value case and just say exactly what, what you're looking for. What sort of value? What, mm-hmm. what, what, what's your focus? What's your current state? You know, what's your product? What's your current state? And what are you moving to? So I do something called um, a BAS, which is a business agility snapshot. So the first thing I do is a snapshot of where you are. The BAS, the business agility snapshot, it has several elements in there. And it looks at your current organization and what you're struggling with and where you want to get to. And so, yeah, it's almost like a business agility assessment. But it's a snapshot. Mm-hmm. It's a quick snapshot of where you are. Yeah, moment in time. And, and absolutely. And some of the elements that I use in my engagements after the snapshot is, one, transparency. Two, because once you have transparency, you make everything brutally transparent. That's number one. Make everything transparent. Two, alignment. Once we have alignment, then we, you know, we can begin to connect the dots. Number three, once we have this in alignment, then we have engagements. Number three is engagements. And then number four, structure. You know, we look at structure. How you structure portfolio, program, whatever team. What's in place? What sort of structure do you have? And then, of course, we look at <clears throat> we look at process and how are you working? What do you you know? What are the elements in in your ways of working? And then after that, then I look at um, content. What's your content? You know, what do you have in your content? And then we look at you know um, metrics, KPIs, and a few other bits and pieces. So transparency, alignment, engagement, structure, process, content, and metrics. And by doing that, and that feeds into the snapshot, the BAS, you know, this business agility snapshot. Mm-hmm. By, by just doing these elements, guess what? Managers and executives, um, they just turn around and say, Nana, you're making a lot of sense. If I have this, then this is a good way for me to start to understand the problems I'm facing. And of course, I mean, uh, on the back of that, um, there's, I've been for many years, I've been focusing on flow, not necessarily flow from Kanban, but Kanban is a good strategy to optimize uh, value, you know, the delivery mm-hmm. of value. But, you know, looking at flow from the perspective of, you know, I go back to Ailey Goldratt's book, the, you know, the, the goal, yeah, and the TOC, Theory of Constraints. I mean, these are some of the books that I enjoyed reading back in the day. And Essentially, <laughs> what I've been looking at, you know, over the last 20 odd years is if we take out the impediments and we take out the blockers and we're able to visualize all of that and then look at the dependencies, uh, you know, we address the dependencies, take, you know, look at blockers, showstoppers, impediments, just look at what's slowing the organization down or what's stopping the organization from doing certain things. Mm-hmm. If we just look at all of that, visualize them, and start fixing those things, guess what happens? The organization, without adopting Agile, the organization will begin to have better flow and better agility. And this particular approach, the, the seven elements from the, the, way of work, the way I work, and then the bass, and then the flow, this is what I've been doing for many years, and um, when I, when I, one particular client that I did this with recently, when when I <laughs> I talked to them about my approach, and then they said, you know what, if you came in to talk about Agile, would have kicked you out. We love your approach. We love your common sense. We love the fact that you're not yeah. into this straight straight jacket of agile. And um, I said, well, yeah. this is this is this is this is why I do what I do because for me, age to age. First of all, I connect with people. After connecting with people, I understand what their pain points are, then help them to work through those issues. And guess what? Something that might put a smile on your face. It will put a smile on your face. Just yesterday, I was having a conversation with a client. And then guess what? 
I mean, this is like a, a hundred million pound project, right? <laughs> Program. And it's big, it's global, it's massive. And uh, with millions of people around the world. And uh, Okay. And then uh, the, uh, the chief or the lead product owner, um, I was talking with her. And then I said to her, I said, hang on a minute. Uh, you've got problems and challenges with all these people in different departments and different parts of the organization. And, and it's like, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know where you're heading to. You know, it's like, this is, this is really difficult. And I said to her, I said, let's take a step back for a minute. Why don't we do a pre-mortem analysis? And she said, hang on a minute, explain that to me. And I broke down pre-mortem analysis and she said, Guess what? I've been doing post-mortem analysis in all my assignments. <laughs> I've, been doing post -mortem. I've been doing post-mortems. She said, pre-mortem, pre-mortem. I said, yes, we envisage failure now. And she said, oh, my goodness. And she said, Nana, I wish I could just take the plugs out of your brain and just put them into like a mural or a lucid board and just visualize them because this is exactly what I need. Let's look at all the people everything processes steps procurement look at all the issues finance you know everything that gets in the way of delivery and and she said this is exactly what i'm looking for so already everywhere i go to i mean i've been playing around with red team thinking i for for more than 20 years because it's like i've always been your agent provocateur default. i've always been default uh, uh contrary yeah. thinking you know critical thinking about red team thinking and the tools and techniques and bringing that into the client sites and putting it, you know, putting some nice words around it and put some strategic words around it. It has certainly um, enabled people to begin to look at themselves in a different way and how they think. So that blew, that blew my clients away completely, completely blew her away. So there you go. So awesome. it's, 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 um, it's the lack of thinking or critical thinking is what is affecting agile transformation was, because you know to a large extent they they think that just by copying and pasting the four yeah. values the 12 principles and then some xp or some scrum or some other stuff by copying and pasting all of this with coaches and trainers all of a sudden they will become agile and achieve agility and of course they they, they don't happen. yeah no, not going to happen. And if you add a big consultancy name in the front of it, it's going to be even worse. Uh, I was even, smiling at the right because as you were talking about flow, this book came to and it's it's on my shelf. So I don't think you know the Toyota <laughs> Cat. 20, 2010. Okay, so 13, 14 years old. Managing people for improvement, adaptiveness, and superior results. You know, age is old, and the key thing is people. And this is why people. Toyota is incredible. The flow yeah. of work, the flow of thinking, and this this realization, as you said, that agile big A is failing because of a lack of critical thinking, and all this nonsense of an agile mindset. Again, it's just lipstick on a pig. It's another fancy phrase or word pumped out there by the cult-like followers to try and make it another thing that someone's going to buy. And, and, and as you said, the executives are waking up to this. They don't want oh, this anymore. They're, they're tired. Oh, they of it. are absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's the reason why the, the, uh, the yeah uh, yeah uh, go ahead go ahead. <laughs> no, so in the break, you said agile is dead. Long live agility was a comment that you'd heard on a call recently. Yes, so and in, it is it is because um, and the rates are coming down for agile coaches and trainers. Oh, and, they? And, and scrum masters it's just dropping I because. Of course they are. Well, I think basically uh, people, executives and the procurement departments and organizations and business leaders who make decisions are realizing that that is not what they really are looking for. Um, what they they need bullshitted is, themselves out of a job is what's happened. Absolutely. Pretty much. So, to, to be yeah, for 20, yeah. yeah for, for 20 years, the, it, we've created a sort of, well, they, the movement has created uh, this... Uh, <laughs> This concept, this myth that somehow agile will solve a lot of, uh, you know, their problems, and people cannot, you know, yeah. they're looking for, they're looking for some, you know, the solutions. And unfortunately, some companies have spent twenty million, thirty million dollars, you know, to do agile transformations, and it's been miserable, miserable. It's failed yeah. all over Absolutely. the world. It's been failing. 
I have. You, you mentioned Flow. I just want to do a plug for a great friend of the show and mine, Nigel Thurlow, who's just released the Flow Playbook. So anybody wants oh. to brush up, Nigel works at Toyota, hence I grabbed the book. Nigel oh, nice. worked at Toyota for years. Great experience in Scrum. And again, like us, he's moved away from the Agile Big A concept and understanding flow, thinking, red teaming, to make it a far more collective and holistic way of working, which I think is really fantastic. important. Oh, fantastic. I'm definitely going to get, I need my copy. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure you get one. So as part of Akaditi, you run Scrum Day London and Agile in Africa, yes. of which I am grateful that I have been a keynote speaker at both of these events. Let and our listeners know. And you're coming back what next year. Is. You're coming back I am next indeed. year. And I'm coming to Africa. I'm going to be you're, live at five in Africa. You're, you're good. Oh, Without my doubt. goodness. After your presentation, it's like everybody was sat there quietly <laughs> thinking, okay. <laughs> they were responding on Mentimeter. And uh, I looked around and I saw the audience face and I thought, okay, Marcus has done it. I knew I had to bring you. I know. It was like. You know, there was stuff exploding in people's heads and saying, hang on a minute, okay, this is making sense. This is really making sense. And I could see that, you know, there are people in the audience that are thinking, okay, I need to get my head screwed on properly to, to get this, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, uh, Scrum Day London has been... I love it. No, 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 I love it. I, but I, I, I did it on purpose, you see, as product know, owner, you, you know, know Scrum you Day London, I did it on purpose. And so... Um, uh, bad, good man. <laughs> I know, I know, terrible, really full of mischief. So uh, I've you been are. been doing, you know, I had a word with Ken Schwaber, um, Scrum.org, you know, when he left Scrum Alliance. And then, I mean, I like Ken because every time I talk to Ken about agility, he, he, he understands where I'm coming from. And so he I said to him, he, he gets it. Oh, he gets it. And, um, that's why Ken hasn't done anything big about scaling and many other things because he just said, look, just do the basics and then you can add stuff to it later. And uh, he gets it. So I said to Ken, I want to do something, you know, in the London space, you know, and in the UK. And he says, I mean, I'll support you. And then Martin Inshawood and a few other people jumped in, Adesha Koyat, some other people. And uh, it became in 2014. And then we did the first one in 2015 and it was amazing. So scrumdaylondon.com, that happens every year in London. And Agile in Africa, same thing, supported by Scrum.org and now Pro Kanban and now RedTeamThinking.com. So oh, hey. we've got, we've okay. got a number of really cool partners in what we're doing. Now, the, the theme for next year, for 2024. Yes, I was going to ask you about that because this year's theme was excellent, but I'm excited because oh. you told me, you teased me before, you told me you weren't going to tell me until today. So drum rolls. Yes. Drum roll. What is the theme? <laughs> Drum roll. The, the theme for 2024 is removing the barriers to critical thinking. And uh, below wow. that, we've got... So the main, the main theme is removing the barriers to critical thinking. Below that, we've got thinking outside of the agile box. And, uh, and then underneath that, we've got optimizing flow and value across your organization. But the main theme... Who wouldn't want that, eh? Re removing the barriers to critical thinking. And, and you know, I, you, you've I been through I, our I, training. And guess what? Yes, I, I went through the training and became Go a on. practitioner, practice leader, red teamer. It's you and Bryce Hoffman are to blame for this. this thing. Yes, <laughs> you are Again, the culprits. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> you are Good the culprits. You, you. Are, you are the culprits because removing the barriers to That's critical thinking... To it was such an obvious thing for me, thinking outside of the agile box. It basically, it's a call to action for those involved yeah. in business transformation and change management to say it's yeah. about time you drop this nonsense and you need to start thinking seriously about common sense, critical thinking, and really thinking outside of that agile box. You know, take the box away, throw the box away. There's no box, you know. So, um, yeah. um, no Scrum Day London, no boundaries, no boundaries. And so, Scrum Day London next year, it's really about uh, removing those barriers. So, critical thinking, this is what is impeding organizational agility. And that's the reason why you're coming back next year as a keynote speaker uh, for Scrum Day London and also a keynote speaker. Uh, you are going to kick off the conference and I'm going to get you to be one of the people to close the conference because I want you at the beginning and I want you at the end. If so I don't people... get lynched after the first 
talk as well. Don't uh, you gonna no, have to put security and chicken wire got, like a Blues Brothers I, concert? I've got, I've got, I've got a special SWAT team ready. You know, these are ex army as big as you and all your police guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got ex army and ex police guys. I mean, it's like on standby. And um, I mean, the, the the thing for me will be next year that we really do need to take this to the next level. Um, I want to go head to head with the agile community to make them understand that you know it's about time we begin to change the the mindset. We need to really look at you know our thinking. We need to look at you know what we're giving to organisations, and we need to make things better. Bring people together to do great things. That is essentially what we should be about. I, I'm going to play. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I'm going to play the listener who's listening, going, "What are you talking about, Nana?" I am a critical thinker. I've got a brain, aren't, aren't I? <laughs> do, people not, do people not think critically, Nana? Well, they're doing copy and paste. A lot of the time, you know, when you, when you look at these four values and 12 principles, they look good, and they look at all the practices that come out of that, they look good. But guess what this is doing? It is actually making people to be very unagile because they're doing copy and pasting. Mm -hmm. They're not really doing any fundamental thinking around, okay, this is the organizational design. This is the organizational structure. This is our culture. We need to tweak things a little before we start doing the practices, the ways of working. Before we start talking about the ways of working, why don't we talk about the ways of thinking? I love that. And that's where my quote came from. 21st century ways of working don't work with 20th century ways of thinking. We've left our brains back in the 80s and 90s, and we're still thinking linear change projects, you know, one step after the other. Doesn't work in the complex world we now live in. We've got to think differently. We've got to take these tools and use them as intended, Absolutely. not as a crutch, not as a driving force of this is how you do it. Brilliant tools are out there, and they're all failing at a rapidly, you know, abominable rate because people aren't thinking how to use them. There's nothing wrong with Agile. There's nothing wrong with Lean Six Sigma. There's nothing wrong with Scrum, Kanban, whatever. Whatever tool you're using, it's a bloody good tool. That's if you're it. not thinking, if you're not engaging the people, if you're not bringing this holistic viewpoint and looking at all the different elements, the entities, the angles, and pausing, yes. pausing for patience yes. and pausing for effect... Yes. And then you act, you respond. Yeah. Then you're going to dive straight in. As you said, you're going to go copy, paste. And this goes back to what we call satisficing. Quick, That's rapid, right. solutionizing with whatever works well, good enough. Yeah. But then the wheels start to come off. And how many agile transformations? They all start off great, don't they? It's wonderful. The, the euphoria of the first three months and then month four, the rag status, watermelon reporting begins. It's all yeah. green. It's all green. Quick audit, all red inside why is Absolutely. that? Because you haven't taken the time to think before you dive in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. So next year, what are the dates? Do we know? Scrum Day London is the 20th and 21st of June. And um, that okay. will be in London. And uh, you, you know, people can go to the website, you know, scrumdaylondon.com. And then Agile in Africa is the 23rd, the 24th, and the 25th. And um, I'm dedicating... Each day, I'm dedicating uh, a space for red team thinking. A space for red every single day. We're going to have a space for red team thinking, and uh, and of course, we're going to think about. Uh, we're going to look at big things fast. <laughs> well, that's a little secret. It's coming. Yes, it's coming. It's coming. Yes, it's, coming. it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Shh, it's so, coming. <laughs> no, no. I, I just want to take some highlights from today. You know, yeah. practicing the pause. I love that. Ubuntu. Brilliant. Agile is dead. Long live agility. This seven steps approach, transparency, alignment, engagement, structure, process, content, metrics. It's just so simple. It's, it's almost like you've used common sense to achieve this clarity of thought. Or maybe you've taken a red pill. What's some, what's some lasting wisdom you'd like to give our listeners before we say farewell? Well, for me personally, I like to say to everyone that uh, never give up your right, never give up your opportunity, never give up that space um, that allows you to think independently from what society and the system is trying to teach you.
uh, or program you to think. Always maintain a level of independent thinking. Always think deeply about what you need to look at. And when you see things going a certain way, don't jump on the bandwagon. Try to think first before you actually respond. Never react. Never join the bandwagon. Just make sure that you think, you pause, you respond. And um, have the possibility mindset. And the possibility mindset is rooted in critical thinking where nothing is impossible, but you make sure that before you take that next step, you've looked at all the options, you understand exactly where you are, and you can take the best route, at least given the circumstances, you take the best route that will get you to where you need to be. But never give up the art of experimentation, never give up the art of critical thinking, never give up the possibility mindset and um, every single day, just keep expressing love for what you're trying to do because you can break through any challenge you put your mind to. As long as you love yourself, you love your situation, you're able to embrace Ubuntu, look at people and look at the best, you know, get the best out of people for being who they are. And you can, you'll have, you can go to the moon and back, you can go to Mars and back, you can go anywhere and back as long as you empower people. Just bring them together to do great things. And that's it. I'm pausing. I'm practicing my pause because, wow, wonderful words, Nana. Thank you so much. I mean, I think that was so appropriate for the world we're all in today and the problems we're facing personally, professionally, society, globally. So take heed from what this, this wonderful man has just shared with us all for the last hour. I can't wait to continue this journey with you together, and I look forward to meeting up again in person. I'm not going to try and address you. It's never going to happen. I'm just going <laughs> to sit back and look at you in awe and enjoy more great conversations. <laughs> I am inspired by you, Marcus. You know, I'm inspired. When I look at you, I only think about a few words. Be like water. <laughs> Be water. <laughs> Be water. Be like water. Cheers to That's that. That's it. Cheers to that. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, my brother. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.